back over to our speaker, this afternoon, it's all good. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, and thank you, Carl. Thank you, Ron, for this wonderful beginning of this morning. And thank you also for uh, the groaning and the anticipation metaphor with which I wish to continue this last session of our conference, which is going to be quite painful. Uh, when I was preparing this last session, uh, I was torn apart between facing the reality <coughs> with courage and seeing the darkness as it is, and yet holding on to the hope. So the groaning and hope metaphor with which we started this morning is very appropriate for this last session. What I want to do is to bring with as much realism as possible and with as much objectivity as possible the state of the Muslim world in relation to science and religion dialogue and then in the second half the state of the world in relation to our technological breakthroughs which have also created crises at multiple levels. And I was very pleased to hear the theme of the, uh, the speaker of the next conference as well, and I hope this dialogue would continue. Uh, we are all in it, and we are all in a terrible state, both at the level of what's happening to human beings, real human beings, who are seldom perceived as real through the news media, because we have been all desensitized, and to the earth. But I do have a message of hope as well, and not from myself, but from the highest authority, God himself. So the last thing I would like to do with you this morning is to ask you to stand up and recite this last uh, paragraph, which is an adaptation and an explanation of a prophetic prayer that the Sufi poet Abdurrahman al-Jami of the 15th century put into a poem. So when it, I come to that point, I'll have the text, it's a short poem, let's stand up and make that prayer together in continuation of how we started this morning. This last session is going to focus on technology more than it will focus on science and also on the contemporary realities of our world, as I said, starting with the Muslim world. And the subtopics for this presentation are the Muslim world today. Where did it come from? How did it come to what it is right now? What is the state of science and technology in the Muslim world? And then technology a technological transformation of the world in which we live. The Muslim world today officially consists of 57 states, and they have all become members of what is called OIC. It started out in 1967 as the Organization of Islamic Conference in Rabat, there are some 1.3 billion human beings, men, women, and children, living on the face of this earth today, who all proclaim 
اشهد ان لا اله الا الله واشهد ان محمد رسول الله اي تيستيفاي ذات ذير از نو جاد بت جاد اند محمد از ميسنجر ذيس تو اتيستيشنز سبوكن ويز ذا تونغ اند اتيستيفايد باي ذا هارت ميك ذيم مسلمز از سمبل از ذات جست ذيس تو اتيستيشنز and every fourth person now makes this proclamation making them muslims now the world that we in which they live i'm not talking about the millions of muslims who are outside the 57 states especially in places like india where there are 175 million muslims which constitute even a bigger number than many of the muslim states by muslim states we mean the states where the predominant population is muslim and the people who are living in europe north america south africa but the the world the muslim world the official officially recognized 57 states they are the fall out of the three great empires which were before the remaking of the of the of the world after the second after the first world war these three great empires the ottoman the safavids and the mughal empires ruled over what is called the traditional lands where muslims had lived ever since the message of islam came for 1400 years this region of the globe this region of the earth has been home to these communities and the latest of the remaking of this period was in the form of the safavid the ottoman and the mughal empire now the safavid and the mughal empires despite their enormous importance in the history of muslims and the history of world were geographically in a limited area the mughal empire was concentrated in the indian subcontinent the safavid empire was concentrated in what is now the you know is iraq whereas the ottomans ottomans were the real driving force both intellectually and politically for so long starting in the at the end of the uh, 1299 when the ottoman empire was established and lasting until after the first world war so what we now see as the middle east was actually a province of the ottoman empire for a very long period and this remaking has lots of political and military and historical factors but our focus is in the emergence of these states how did they emerge and what was the state of these 57 countries when they came into existence starting with the mughal empire established with one of my favorite persons in history zahiruddin babur babur was a poet and a young man as a young man he was left with 17 soldiers at one point in his life he was the prince from the mughal lineage in afghanistan and through internal conflicts and wars of the among the mughals he was at one point left with just 17 people but his hope was very strong although he suffered through several setbacks he arrived in the indian subcontinent crossing the river indus <laughs> and established this empire which is called the mughal empire because his lineage was from the mughals and he died very early and the story of his death that used to move me when i was a, in my early teens was that his only son humayun became sick and when he became sick babur was so in love with his only son that he made seven rounds around the sick bed of the sick sick boy and he prayed to god saying oh god take me instead of my son take me instead of my son and they say as the episode goes as he finished his rounds he started to become sick and his son started to 
regain strength. And Babu died, Hamayu lived, and then Hamayu became his successor. And he was attacked at that time, and he had to flee to Iran for a while, and then he came back. And then, after he came back, Mughal Empire was fully established. And this is a very important empire because there are people like Akbar and Shah Jahan, the builder of the Taj Mahal. This empire achieved tremendous amount of strength and wealth and accomplished some great deeds in the form of architectural monuments that they have left. Not only just the Taj Mahal, but also several mosques. And the famous... Uh, 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 the, the, the famous crown, the British crown, the, the, the jewel that went through the British crown is called the jewel in the crown, the British Empire. Uh, India was taken over in, in 1857 officially, but the British had been there for a long time before they eventually took over the entire subcontinent as one of their several overseas colonies. Now, this area then emerged as two independent states, India and Pakistan, in 1957, uh, 1947. So, officially, 90 years of the British colonization, but in fact, almost 250 years of British rule over this huge area, which is the subcontinent. Now, the, the Ottomans are a different story. Ottomans are a different story because after Baghdad was sacked, the entire traditional lands of Islam were in turmoil because the central political authority of the caliph was no more. And the caliph was a successor to the prophet. The prophet had both the, the religious authority and the political authority. After the demise of the Prophet, the religious authority was no more. No, there was no more revelation coming. There were no more no, new laws were coming. But the political state was re-established in the form, form of caliphate. And the caliphs were the rulers who were chosen sometimes, sometimes in the Abbasids and the Umayyads caliphs. They were just the, the palace intrigues. And all of that was going on for several centuries until the Mongols came and they destroyed Baghdad, killing almost the entire population in an orgy of blood that used to flow in the streets of Baghdad like a river. It was just terrible. But the caliphate was reestablished in Cairo after Baghdad. And the Mongols were finally defeated in Egypt. And after all of that transition settled down, what emerged was the Ottoman Empire, and because of the high esteem of the office of the caliph, the Ottomans did not feel that they are capable or they are, they are high enough in their religious st status to be called caliphs. So they chose to be sultans. They chose to rule this entire Middle Eastern Empire, and also in Europe, uh, as, as the rulers, as the sultans, rather than being the, the caliphs. Nevertheless, the political consolidation that took place through the Ottomans also established, a re, uh, also revived the intellectual tradition. Several new universities was, were established, the Ottomans were at the forefront of scientific and technological breakthroughs because of their contacts with, the, with European states, which were at that time gaining strength through revolutions in science and technology and through organization of the state. The Ottomans were very much on the forefront of a reform movement within the Islamic, traditional Islamic land. They also ruled Mecca and Medina. And one of, the greatest, one of the greatest aspects of the Ottoman way of ruling was to give space to all legal schools of Islam and four 
there are four schools of uh, legal thought, meaning how do you pray? How do you fast? When does the time start for praying? Minor differences. Whether you recite out loud some of the verses or whether you don't, like the Bismillah, the invocation with which we start the prayer. In some schools you recite it out loud, in some you don't, out of these four. So what they did was they created in the holy mosque which is the only, the only house of God that God himself ordered Prophet Ibrahim to construct in Mecca, to which Muslims go for, a, for pil pilgrimage every year. In that mosque, they had separate chairs and separate areas for each of these four schools to practice their own, at their own, pray at their own time. So they were very, uh, very open and very liberal in the sense of allowing the diversity of opinions. They were also very much into theology. And all the latter theological texts that we have in Islamic tradition are uh, because of them, because of the Ottomans. The other aspect is their great love for Palestine and the, what was called Syro Palestine, which is the Bilad al Sham in Arabic the lands of Sham, the lands of Syria, which traditionally included Iraq, contemporary Iraq, Syria, and Palestine. These were taken as one single unit. And these lands were the lands to which the companions of the Prophet himself migrated shortly after he died. Nobody wanted to leave Medina for as long as the Prophet was there. But when the Prophet died, many of these companions dispersed into the lands of Sham, of Syria. Some because of their emotional attachment, especially like persons like Bilal. Bilal was an Abyssinian slave who was sold in the bazaar in the, in the market of Mecca. This is before the advent of Islam, before the Prophet started to receive the revelation. And his owner was an aristocrat of Quraysh a very wealthy man from Mecca. When the message was revealed to the Prophet, he received the revelation. Among the first believers were several of these slaves. And Bilal, the Abyssinian, he was a black man, strong, was one of them. And his owner at that time, who, was, who didn't believe, who was a great enemy of Islam and, and the Prophet, he, he started to torture him. And we have this eyewitness account of how he would put Bilal on, a, on the burning sand of the Arabian desert and chain him and hit him and say, don't say he is one. Don't say God is one, except the idol so and so and so and so as your gods. And Bilal, his back straining with blood, would say, ahad, 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 one, one, one. That's all he would say. This is Bilal. And because he had a strong voice when the Prophet moved to Medina, he made him the Mawazan, the person who calls people for prayer five times a day. And Bilal would go to the house of a neighbor where the mosque was, stand on the roof, and call in his loud voice, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, come for prayer, come for prayer, rush for prayer, rush for prayer, come for salvation, come for salvation. These are the words of the Azan that he would pronounce. After the Prophet died, he was, whenever he came to the, to the in, in, in the calling of the Azan, there is also the God is great, God is great, and Muhammad is his messenger. The day after the Prophet died, when he went to call the Azan, and he said, Allah, Allah is, God is great, God is great. When he said, Muhammad is his prophet, he started to cry because the prophet had died. He just, he just couldn't do it. His love for the prophet was such that, you know, he would call, when he was in the presence of the prophet, he would call the people to prayer, and now he was gone. So he was shattered. He was just so sad. And he left Medina because of that reason. And he went to Syria. And it's reported that several years later, the second caliph called him once to Medina from Syria. And he said, he came for a visit. This was his only visit to Medina after so many years. 
And somebody said, Bilal, would you go up to that house and call again? And he called, and they said the whole city cried when he called that day. The whole city cried. That was the sadness, and some companions left because of sadness. To be in the same place and same where they used to see and hear and talk and eat with the Prophet and leave us no more. Anyways, the, these companions dispersed to these lands, and that's where they started to establish schools. And, and, and these schools were for the teaching of the Quran, for the teaching of Hadith, of the saying of the Prophet and other theological schools. Huge network of schools was, was established in these lands which were called Iraq, Palestine, and Syria. That's why this region is of huge importance to Islam. Because all of the initial developments in theology, in sciences, took place in these, in these lands. Syria was the last, so was Iraq, but Syria was the center of scholarship for centuries. I went there several times during the last few, few, few decades before all of this started. In 2006, before, just before the rise of this present situation, you could still go to the house so and so which has existed for over a thousand years with a continuous chain of one family having heard the saying of the Prophet from the mouth of a living human being who himself goes back to the Prophet himself. This was the consistency with which this tradition was preserved in these lands. There are scholars, well-known scholars, who have left behind volumes and volumes of commentary of theological works on the Quran and the Hadith and the other aspects of Islamic thought, who lived in Syria, who are known to have, have have had continuous chain going back to the Prophet So this continuity, this continuity is what has been shattered now, and I'll say a few more things about it. So the Ottomans who ruled most of this empire, they were not Arabs. Ottomans were not Arabs. And their love for the Quran, for the Prophet, was such they held Arabs at a, in a very high esteem. And because all the scholarship in Islam at that time was in Arabic, there were works in other languages, but most of it was in, in Arabic. So they patronized scholars. This empire came to a, its end because the Ottoman chose the wrong side during the First World War. They allied with the wrong side. By wrong side, I meant the wrong, mean the wrong side that lost. So this is the map, 2013, of the Muslim world, country-wise. What I want to point out is how this world came into existence and what is the <coughs> demographic setup of this. Uh, you can see the graph here. You would notice that the number of young people in the Muslim world today is co comparably much higher, the percentage is much higher. So a lot of population is young population. Urban and rural divide. Now we come to the sector on science and technology, and I don't need to go into too many details of this because we all know that there is not much by way of science and technology being produced in the Muslim world. There is not much by way of knowledge being produced in the Muslim world today as opposed to the historical uh, setup where the le leadership was in the hands of the Muslims. And most often we just hear the groaning and the complaints, but we don't go into the details of why is the situation as it is, and I want to focus on that. So the distribution of researchers, the, dis, uh, the publication of papers, the publication of patents, and all of those things are indicators of what has gone wrong, or what, what is being done at present, but why it is so depends on how we understand it. I want to, I want to uh, before 
moving on to the next, uh, I want to deconstruct, I want to deconstruct the picture that we normally see, and I heard this and received an email yesterday after our dinner from Dale, uh, a paper, a recent paper, a 2011 paper, uh, where the author says how, why the Arabs turn their back to science. And uh, this is one of the 19th century formulation. Ernest Renan, the French uh, scholar and philosopher, wrote a newspaper article in 1898 in which he said that Muslims have done nothing in science for centuries and whatever little accomplishments they made were actually the Greek science that they translated. And uh, Jamaluddin Afghani, who was, uh, who was in, from Afghanistan, was traveling and he was in Paris and he wrote a rebuttal to that. But Ernest Renan, in the second installment of the same thing, he said, actually, it's not the Muslims, it's Islam that has stifled science because it lacks the spirit of inquiry. Now, this formulation of 1898 was recycled by Gozahir in his very influential 1915 article titled, it's an it's article in German which has been translated into English and French and other languages and it remained a central reference in the academic study of Islam, science in Islam for, for several decades. It's called a Religious Orthodoxy against foreign sciences. Now, his idea of foreign sciences is all of the natural sciences. And his presentation says that Arabs and received natural sciences from the Greeks, they remained foreign because Islam did not have the capacity for rational inquiry. He repeated what Ernest Renan had said. All of the subsequent texts from Gozahir until now rely on this false, historically false assumption that for two centuries, and only for two centuries, science flourished. And they say by the time of 13th century, there was no more science left. And this is historically inaccurate as we know now. But they choose Al-Ghazali about whom we talked yesterday, as the person who stifled science because he was against rational inquiry. Now, historically, this is inaccurate because Al-Ghazali died in 1111. And yesterday, you saw the example of Ulag Beg, 1459. If a simple math can be performed between 1459 and 1111, how many centuries are there, of very high quality science existing. Even the letter that Jamshedudin Kashi that I read out yesterday is taken as an evidence. This is a first hand account of one single place called Samarkand, where the Sultan, who is the Ulag Beg, Sultan Ulag Beg, could solve complex mathematical equations sitting on the horseback. And there are 60 and 70 astronomers and mathematicians working there. And I have visited that, that observatory that, some, that was built in Samarkand. And the complex city, complex city of the mathematical formulations, the higher level math and astronomy that was going on. And this is just one place out of several. So historically, this picture is inaccurate, but the mainstream narrative, the mainstream story doesn't want to change. And there are reasons other than objective scholarship for that. <coughs> there, are, there are fundamental research works by non-Muslims. Edward Kennedy, David King, I.S. Sabra, Ahmad Dalal, who's a Muslim, 
these people, these are historians of science trained mostly in university system in, in America who have narrowed down and done research on instruments and manuscripts that they discovered in various parts of the world, studied and produced analytical critical editions. And that's how we know about the Tusi couple, the example I gave yesterday. So historically, this is absurd to say science died with Ghazali. <coughs> but nevertheless, it persists for other reasons. Although new books have been published, but the mainstream just relegates science in the Muslim world after Al Ghazali to a footnote. But that's hopefully would change. We hope. We hope that this narrative, this story would change one day. I want to now concentrate on the second aspect of uh, the session, which is even darker than the first. That is the technology. And you will notice that behind this, these, uh, all of these present uh, slides is a motherboard that my wife put there. These motherboards you would find in every single device that we use now. And if you examine, they are all green, and they have a very thin layer of heavy metals. And there is a graveyard of these motherboards in China. And if you, some of you are interested in chemistry, if you go and look at the extraction process of these heavy metals, and their disastrous results for this earth. You would never want to buy another cell phone unless the market economy forces us. These are, these are things I would like to talk. But before that, Heisenberg, who is one of my favorites, uh, who gave us this uncertainty principle, wrote in 1958, I believe, one has to remember that every tool carries with it the spirit by which it has been created. This is a, such a wonderful quote, and it's such a wonderful insight in, late, in the late 50s, because Heisenberg was a giant, he was a giant. The tool carries a spirit, and when it arrives in a different culture in which it is a foreign tool, those people do not adopt, and if we think of tools, if we think of technology, it's tools. But if we think of technology as reshaping and reforming our daily routines, the way we communicate, the way we produce food, the, the materials we use, all of these things then are foreign to the culture and the civilization where they are imported. And I always, I am always baffled by this one single phenomena, and that is the, the cars we drive. Any one of you who have traveled to the Muslim world, to Africa, to other places where cars are a foreign tool, foreign object, would have noticed that no laws are observed to move these machines on the road. <laughs> you know why? Because the camels and the horses, they were used, they were the local modes of transportation. They didn't require these straight lanes. You could go anywhere and pass your way through in the crowded streets, right? So they, even now, if after so many decades of using cars and everything, just the simple, simple system of following, being in your lane is absent. And as a result, there's chaos on the streets. It's just amazing. And this, I always think of Heisenberg when, when I see this chaos, because all these cars are. Now, what they do, they turn even the six lane highways into parking lots. <laughs> and I've been stuck in Tehran and Istanbul, you know, trying to go to the airport. And then you are in the middle of this highway, which is supposedly a six lane highway. And you, can never, you cannot go back, and you cannot go forward, because somebody has, it's, it's just amazing. So the world today in which we live is technologically construed. This is the only planet, as far as we can tell so far, that is home not only to Muslims, but also 
to everyone. All humanity has just one single place to live. And this place, according to the Quran, was given to humanity as a mana, as a trust. And we, you and me, and everyone is a khalifa, a caretaker of this trust. We don't own, but we are the stewards. This is the fundamental aspect of the message of the Quran that God, the sustainer, created us he placed us on this earth and he gave us as a trust. So the, the, the aspect of being the Khalifa, Khalifa, Khalf in Arabic means successor, is perpetual. Generation after generation after generation, humanity is in perpetual stewardship of this earth. Now, if we look at the state of this earth today, and these are not photoshopped images that I'm going to show you. These are real images of what we have done to this earth. So the question is, what is to be done? What 
is our responsibility in a situation where the earth is groaning, humanity is bleeding, there are two million refugees, Syrian refugees in Jordan alone. That land which was the cradle of civilization has been devastated. And the day after day after day, we hear these statements and we see this <coughs> debate between the players, but no end to the suffering. Even today there is a news about the ongoing oppression in Bhutan, which is killing civilians, children, women, old people stuck in that war. As if nothing is happening. How can, how can anybody let such a thing continue, not only for days or weeks, but for years? Like, what has gone wrong? What is to be done? We call this thing environmental crisis, political crisis, but is it that? I would like to suggest that it's crisis of the human heart that has closed itself to the message of God. The crisis of the human heart has blinded humanity and the suffering is so intense that you and me and people who have no power to change, to make decisions, have no recourse but to protect the bleeding heart by saying, I can't stand this. I can't see this blood. We feel helpless. Ever since millions of us walk, marched on the streets of New York, Washington, Paris, London, saying no to the Iraqi invasion. You remember those days when there was such a great movement to stop this war to happen. And we were overruled and they attacked Iraq and unleashed something that is still going on after all these years. They not only left behind radioactive depleted uranium in that soil and in that water, but they also sowed the seeds of which fruit is now coming. Nobody is in favor of a Saddam Hussein or Gaddafi or any of those tyrants. But is that the way? to destabilize these societies? Is this the way to have benefits of technology by ravaging this planet, by producing things like this? This disease of the heart has three Quranic descriptions. The first one is called Israf. Israf is excess in the sense of wastefulness. It's not because they didn't have a lot of food, but it was out of respect for food that the Prophet and his companions, when they finished something, there would be nothing left on the plate on the, on the, from which they ate. The amount of food we are wasting, throwing in the dump, is just enormous. The amounts of things we are consuming on a daily basis is just it's rough. This is the excess. And one verse of the Quran says that God does not love the musrifin, those who do the israf, the israf, the excess. The second is the heedlessness. The Quranic word is the rafla. The heart, the heart is revived by the remembrance of God, one verse tells us. Allah bi dhikrullahi tatmain al -kuroob. The hearts gain contentment by the remembrance of God. And rafla is the opposite of that. In our prayers this morning, the essential inner connection of all the words and all the songs and all the, all the things we, we did was the remembrance of God in various forms. What we were doing 
is trying to have that presence in our hearts. Ghafla is the opposite of that. The third aspect is the forgetness, forgetfulness of being the khulafa, being the stewards. We have taken charge of God's creation and we are remaking it in our image. And technology is helping us to do that. It's like having a teenager suddenly come to strength and not knowing what to do with their strength. We have made tremendous leaps in technology, but we have not developed a moral framework in which this technology can be used. Just because we have the, gained the ability to split atom does not give us the license to produce atomic bombs and use them. Just because we can, we understand the DNA of fruits and vegetables, it doesn't give us the license to distort them because we don't know the consequences. So, what is our collective religious responsibility? I'm not speaking of politicians, I'm not speaking of philosophers, I'm speaking to you as a collective body of believers who believe in the fundamentals of our existence, that we are a creation of God, this earth is a creation of God, that we carry responsibility, how we act, how we behave, what we do while we are on this earth. It's a question, and I don't want to go into answer, because each one of us, each one of us has to provide an answer to this question. What is my responsibility today while I am alive and able to function and do something? We all carry both personal and collective responsibilities. The question is, how do we fulfill our role as the khulafa, as the stewards? And as I said, I would end with a prayer but before the prayer is a saying of the Prophet, upon him peace, he said, In kamat ala ahadikumul kiyama wa fi yadihi fasila wal yagrisha. The translation is very difficult, but the message is that if one of you is holding a shoot, a fasila is something from which you can grow a plant, whether a tree or a in your hand, and you see the hour coming, plant it. Because the responsibility we carry, the hour is going to come when God wills it, but the responsibility we carry is in our hands because we have this palm shoot in our hand and it's our responsibility to plant it. The prayer about which I mentioned with which I wish to end this talk and for which I would request you to stand up once the text is there is adaptation from another saying of the Prophet on him peace who used to supplicate to God, saying, Allah ma'adin al-haqqa haqqan. O God, show us the truth as truth and grant us the ability to follow it. O God, show us the batil, show us the falsehood as falsehood and grant us the ability to avoid it. Abdurrahman Jami, a Persian mystic and poet of the 15th century put it into this beautiful supplication and I would request you to please let's stand up and make this prayer together and you can read out loud from the screen Oh God deliver us from our preoccupation in worldly vanities 
Show us the nature of things as they really are. Remove from our eyes the veil of ignorance and show us things as they really are. Show not to us non-existence as existed, nor cast the veil of non-existence over the beauty of existence. Make this phenomenal world the mirror to reflect the manifestations of thy beauty and not a veil to separate and repel us from thee. Cause these unreal phenomena of the universe to be for us the source of knowledge and insight and not the cause of ignorance and blindness. Our alienation and severance from our beauty all proceed from ourselves. Deliver us from our ourselves and accord to us intimate knowledge of thee. Amen. Thank you very much. May God help us. May God help us to walk on His path, and may God help us to spread His light. and live on this earth for as long as you have granted us to live with integrity, without excesses, and in fulfillment of the promise that we made to you. Amen. Amen.